Hi, I'm Guy Powell, and welcome to the next episode of The Backstory on Marketing. If you haven't already done so, please visit ProRelevant.com and sign up for all of these episodes and podcasts. I am the author of the newly released book, The Post-COVID Marketing Machine, Prepare Your Team to Win. And you can find more information about that book at marketingmachine.prorelevant.com. You know, today there are so many things going on in ad tech and uh, a lot of confusion and a lot of change uh, coming up. And today, though, we're going to have a lot of those questions addressed and hopefully answered. We're going to be interviewing Jeff Greenfield, and his background is all about all things ad tech. So let me tell you a little bit about Jeff. Jeff is an entrepreneur with three decades of strategy, growth and marketing, experience building and leading teams with an emphasis on innovative marketing enabled by new technology. His background includes founding and senior roles with Provolytics, Wide Orbit, C3 Metrics, working for a number of major brands such as JP Morgan, US Bank, Hertz, and many, many others. He's also very active in the Media Ratings Council and was named Star of Attribution by Sequent Partners. Uh, uh, Jeff also studied biochemistry going way back at the University of Maryland. He interned at the National Institutes of Health, obtained his Doctor of Chiropractic and BS in Human Biology from Southern California, University of Health Sciences. And he is an instrument rated pilot and performing member of the Magic Castle in Hollywood. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you so much, Guy. Excited to be here today. Yeah, you know, it's funny, you you had that in there. And then like two weeks after I saw that, um, I heard about what the Magic Castle was and I ran into somebody else. So uh, fantastic. If we get some time, I'll ask you some questions on that. But before we do that, let's get into really the, the heart of the, of the matter and the meat of the matter. And uh, first of all, tell us uh, about your backstory in marketing. How did you get started with your career in marketing and ad tech? Well, it, it definitely was not a linear path, but you know, now I look back, everything kind of makes sense. Uh, it, 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 I'll start where you ended up at, which was I was a magician. I think all all kids get get excited about magic, and I started doing magic when I was very young. Did it all throughout college and grad school. So I started as a magician. I went to chiropractic college because it used my hands, and my my favorite type of magic was uh, close up magic. And as a chiropractor, you're building a practice and you put a shingle out and you have to learn how to market. So that's really where I started my marketing. Same is true as with the magic. You're, you're, you're a, a solo entrepreneur, if you will. Uh, and then an injury led me down a path where I got out of practice, didn't know what I wanted to do and decided to go back on the road and do magic. So I went back to magic again, but this was right around the birth of the internet. And so I needed to have a website. So I ended up building up a website, needed to be able to promote it. And that led me down a path of, you know, once you have a website, you have to be at the top of the search engines and then started a consulting career and then started doing a lot more in terms of branded entertainment and all sorts of uh, bigger programs for larger corporate clients. And then this thing of measurement came about. And this was right around the birth of digital marketing, the mid 2000s. And what I started to see is that marketers had all these great killer ideas, but, and they would go out and do them, but in order for them to continue doing them, they needed to be able to prove to finance that this actually resulted in dollars in. And if they couldn't do that, they couldn't follow through with it. And all of a sudden I realized, wow, this, this measurement aspect is really kind of the pivot point of marketing. And it's, kind of sexy. You know, it's kind of strange to say that because analytics is kind of seen as kind of nerdy type stuff. And there are aspects of it that's very nerdy, but it is this kind of pivot point between marketing and finance. And I was really, really intrigued by that and built up this uh, first ad tech company, C3 Metrics, to solve the problem for marketers and focus primarily on enterprise. These are marketers that are always on, always spending large dollars, and that's a, that's a different scenario than marketers that are saying, hey, I've got a new product that I'm bringing to market. So when you start to think about banks that are always advertising and pharmaceutical companies that are always out there, they deal with a lot of interesting issues. And I exited C3 in 2019, thinking that I was never going to go back to measurement. And then all of a sudden, all these strange things started to happen in the world of ad tech. 
all of a sudden things that were foundational to how the internet and how digital operated just changed. It was as though the carpet got pulled out from underneath all of us. And all of a sudden I, I looked and I saw, wow, there seems to be this movement backwards. And that's when I realized that I needed to come back into the market. And that's what led me to the creation of Provolytics. Yeah, fantastic. Very interesting. And I like your uh, story of uh, magic. And, uh, you know, <laughs> the interesting thing is, although a lot of people think the internet and marketing is uh, magic, it is absolutely not. And uh, those people that get analytics uh, in marketing really get past the magic and actually add science to it. So uh, so tell us about Provolytics. So uh, what uh, what started that and uh, where does that fit into the into the equation? Well, I'll, I'll go backwards a little bit too, because to understand Provolytics and understand where we're at, we have to understand kind of what's happening in the marketplace. So if we go back to before 2005, before digital became part of every marketer's, uh, if you will, their, their bag of tricks to use the, the magic analogy there, uh, all we really had was we had TV, we had radio, we had print, we had direct mail, most, in fact, 99% of the marketing that we had, there was no direct path where you could say this person saw this and that resulted in a sale. The only thing you had was coupons. That was it to be able to connect the dots. So you step back as a marketer today and you say, well, how is it that these brands were able to build without having this user level connected data? Well, there was a whole process in science behind called marketing mixed modeling. And what marketing mixed modeling did is that it looked at the channel level. So it looked at TV versus radio versus print. And brands would do a marketing mix modeling study. And it was called a study because it was an actual study. It was a lot of work. You had to collect all of this data. You had to take all of the impressions that were in market for the previous couple of years. You also looked at competitive data, environmental factors. You looked at everything that you could possibly look at and you did a series of regression analysis that would output saying, hey, this is how much you should be spending now this year. This is how much percentage of your budget. So the output was spend X percent of your budget on this channel. And then it was up to the channel managers to go in and optimize. And that's how brands worked for many, many years. When digital came around, marketers started allocating money to digital because all of a sudden they could see results very quickly. They didn't have to wait a year for and marketing mixed modeling or what's called an MMM study, they could like see a click report. They could see it in their analytics report. It was pretty amazing and very exciting. And in the early days of digital, marketing mixed modeling studies looked at digital, but really didn't know how to account for it. And so marketers were left saying, you know, I, I know that digital is doing more because I can actually see it, but it was really an apples versus oranges thing. And that led to the birth of this concept called multi-touch attribution, which see-through metrics was one of the first ones of that. And the idea behind multi-touch attribution was that you could actually see this entire click and impression trail from the first impression all the way through. So instead of in, with MMM, everything was what we would call probabilistic with MTA, multi-touch attribution, everything was deterministic. And what that meant is, is that an advertiser could run an ad on a big site, let's say, and not see any sales as a result of it and cancel the buy at the end of the month. And then nine months later, people could start to show up. And you could see that with MTA because you could see that those people would eventually buy. And that was amazing. Now it required a massive amount of collection of big data. You had to put tags on the websites, tags in all the ads. And it relied upon third-party cookies, first-party cookies, cookie list technology to be able to connect all the dots, but it was a big data project and it used a lot of machine learning and regression analysis to be able to get to that answer. But it was absolutely incredible. And by like 2010, 2011, marketers were like, this is absolutely incredible. This is so much better. And what we started to see, we started to see a lot of marketers who would uh, forego doing MMM studies. In fact, to be honest, a lot of big marketers, even though they're supposed to do MMMs every year, I knew a lot of clients back in the mid 2000s who were relying on MMM studies that had been done four or five years before, because there were a lot of work to do. 
And MTA was a lot of work to set up, but once it was set up, the data would start flowing in. It was very exciting to have this kind of real-time look at data. Now, the issues with it back then were, is it worked really well for digital, didn't work great for traditional media, but that was okay because digital was kind of this growing space, which was amazing. Then all of a sudden over the last couple of years, the bottom has kind of fallen out of everything that's going on with MTA, in particular, the cookie apocalypse, which we'll talk a little bit more about and stuff. But what it means is, is that this deterministic path that all of MTA is based upon, where you have every single digital touch point, every single impression, well, those are gone. You can't see impressions on Facebook anymore. There's no impressions to get on TikTok. None of that is there. So now MTA, we're living in a world of more probabilistic than deterministic. And the future ahead looks even worse. And so I started to say, you know, how is it that we can solve some of the problems that folks are having? Now, the other big issue with multi-touch attribution is that it did a great analysis of all your data, but it did not have any incrementality. It did not tell you how much, how many sales you would have gotten if you hadn't have done this. How many, how many sales each tactic was actually responsible for? But guess what? Marketing mix modeling was always about contribution. It was always, it was always part of that. You don't have to do A-B testing. A-B testing is important if you're just doing a small little tiny test. But when you're doing larger stuff, you can look at incrementality across the board. So I started looking at the benefits of, of marketing mix, the things I liked about it, the things I didn't like. I didn't like the fact it was a study. I didn't like the fact that it was a channel level. I didn't like the fact that it was just sales. I love the fact that MTA was turned it on and it's running. I love the fact with MTA that you could look at multiple KPIs and it could give that granular recommendations. So I merged those two worlds together using machine learning and AI, and that is the birth of Probolytics. Probolytics is essentially attribution evolved for this new cookie list uh, world that we have upon us and privacy centric world and all these other changes that are coming. And as marketers, we got to be ready for them. And Probolytics is prepared for any change that's going to come about. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting how the, uh, the trends in, in digital marketing and then the digital marketing analytics uh, have affected, um, you know, things like marketing mix modeling and MTA or last touch attribution and graduating into MTA and then now kind of stepping back a little bit. And then, of course, uh, with Google supposedly really finally uh, leading us into the cookie apocalypse at the, you know, in 2024. So tell us uh, about the cookie apocalypse and what is that going to do for all of our clients and uh, customers' digital marketing strategies? Well, it, it's, it's really a game changer. And, and you know, people, uh, I think a lot of marketers don't understand that the cookie apocalypse, it, it, it already happened. Mm. It happened a number of years ago in Safari and iOS. Cookies, third-party cookies have, haven't worked. They've never worked, really. Uh, and so as a result, what happened is on the programmatic side of digital is folks said, oh, we can't target Safari users anymore because the cookies aren't working. And they're like, oh, there's a lot more Android people. We'll just target those folks. And so it kind of went unnoticed for a while. But in the measurement world, we noticed very quickly that it's very, it, it, you can't target, you can't measure Safari. Uh, and so that's kind of a, a picture of what's going to happen. And what's really going to occur is the only data that marketers are really going to have available is their own first party data. And what I mean by that is when someone comes to your website, you'll know the source that they use to come to the website, you know, kind of the UTM, the click through parameter of how they got there. You'll know every page that they went to on the site, but you're not gonna know how they found out about getting to your site. And that's the big problem. So if you look in Google Analytics today, you know, probably 90% of your visitors and your sales, it says that they showed up organically. Well, that's just going to continue being the way it is. And really, the question is, what you really want to know is, how is it that they knew to find you in the first place? Because that's where you want to put your marketing dollars. And there's a great, great book out there that really talks about what's happened in the trends. It's a book called Lemon uh, by Orlando Wood, how the advertising brain turns out. I have my 
I've got my copy right here. This is this is like my Bible. It's an absolutely amazing book. I, I would say this is like the number one marketing book. What's wonderful about it, and it's like 60 bucks on Amazon. I understand it's an expensive book. I have I, I don't own the book. I have I'm not making any money off of this, but it's so good because it talks about how the trend since 2006 has been for marketers to move dollars from upper funnel to lower funnel because you can measure it because it's attributable and you can prove it to the CFO that it's actually doing something. And we see that trend even happening even more, trying to get as close to the sale as possible. Now we've got this whole new emerging area of retail media. Someone's adding something to their Walmart cart and I'm Irish Spring. I want to I want to try to conquest. This book shows is that as marketers move more dollars to lower funnel, the funnel gets shorter. It's not getting filled up as much. And advertising effectiveness mm. has just plummeted. And that's why we're seeing these incredible stories like Airbnb and others that have done away with the bottom of the funnel marketing and they're focusing on brand. Brand is the new big thing, as though it's new. It's never been well, new. Who, who would have thought? <laughs> I know, but branding is now sexy. Branding is now smart because folks have realized, wow, when you spend dollars in brand, it actually lifts things even more. And so what's gonna happen is, is that we have this scenario now where we have an entire generation of marketers who don't understand branding, who have lived their entire careers inside of Google Analytics, who are used to user level data. That's been their reality. And CMOs as well that are used to that, that you could go in and target folks so easily. And now we're moving to this back to the future era where all of a sudden we're not gonna be able to target. We need to focus on things that are probabilistic and as I've been saying to folks, we need to pan the camera back and look at the bigger picture. And that's what Provolytics does is that when we look at the bigger picture, we can actually see what is lifting other channels. We can see the synergistic effect of what's working, what's actually not working, and actually improve our KPIs and be able to tell a better story of finance, which is going to rise budgets. Because right now we're in a world of cuts. I mean, that's CFOs are always about cutting, but I'm telling you right now, you know, lately, what we've been seeing is, is, you know, the CFOs are looking at their checklist. Okay, what's the most expensive thing? Headcount, let's cut. They're cutting more of that. What's the next most expensive thing? Cloud. Cloud costs have started to rise. They're going to start cutting that next. And then, of course, it's marketing. Marketing's always been on the chopping block. People always talk about, oh, I'm a data-driven marketer. I'm a data-driven CMO. What that is really supposed to mean is that you know how to use an Excel spreadsheet for math to speak the language of finance. And you need to be able to prove that what you're doing is actually going to be able to get the results. And the only way you're going to do that is to take your nose out of the user level data. And that's the other thing that's happening is that why is this cookie apocalypse happening? It's happening because of all the privacy regulations. It started with GDPR in the, in the UK, where all of a sudden, if you had a list of people, those people were no longer part of the list. You had to get permission for them to opt in. And then CCPA in California that said, people, you can use that list, but if someone wants to opt out, you have to allow it. You have to give them access to the list. And now in almost every single state in the US, there is a new privacy regulation that's either been passed or is in the process of being passed because there's nothing federal as of yet. So the environment for this is getting more and more difficult. And, and the messaging out there is, User level, that's not the way to go anymore. And guess what? The proof is that user level, having your head in that deep into the data actually doesn't benefit your brand. It actually hurts it. Mm. You know, you uh, as you were talking, and uh, I, might, I might go off on a slight tangent, but of um, uh, you know, you think about top of the funnel, bottom of the funnel, um, and you think about new accounts versus existing. What happens if you focus in on, let's say, bottom of the funnel, you then in order to because that if you get somebody to buy your stuff, that's a brand touch. I mean, and it's a very deep engagement with your stuff. And uh, so what that means, though, is to really get value out of that bottom of the funnel stuff, which is getting harder and harder, is then your customer experience has to be really, really good, significantly better than the competition. and and generally also better than 
the kind of the generic competitor, which would be Amazon or some of the other bigger sites. And so then you kind of have this, uh, this bifurcation, you have uh, CX and very low funnel stuff to get people to convert. And then you have, of course, the brand touches where you're trying to get new people. Once I get people that are in my site and I know who they are and I can go after them with some direct marketing, you know, that's one thing. And if I get, and impress them with my customer experience, then, then hopefully they'll come back the next time they have a need. But what I have to do with my brand now is I have to be very, very good at uh, top of the funnel because I need to get new people in the funnel, regardless of how good my bottom of the funnel and, and CX is. I've got to get people in the top of the funnel. And that's then where this playoff now, I think, is between, you know, brand advertising and then, you know, this conversion marketing that you might be doing down at the bottom of the funnel. And Guy, you really hit on something really important there that I, I don't think that a lot of folks today in direct-to-consumer marketing understand is that when, when you're in the world of e-commerce, the job of media is to drive people to the website. It's really to increase the number of sessions that you have on your website. Media is, is not necessary, even though you're buying media to generate sales, at that point, it's kind of a handoff. The website then becomes a salesperson who's supposed to sell the products. Now, media can actually enhance that. Media can actually improve your conversion rate. But a lot of times what folks don't understand is you're buying media and all of a sudden sales tank. And it's like, oh, what did we buy wrong? And it's like, no, they did an update on the website that messed up the, <laughs> yes. the shopping cart or something like that. Yep, yep, so yep. it's important to, to not always look at your media that it's supposed to drive sales. That's the ultimate goal, but there is kind of a funnel in e-commerce. And the other important thing as well is that what people don't understand is that there's an emotional underlying aspect in all of us humans that, that goes along with the buying process. And one of the, the best researchers out there has done an incredible job of, of documenting this and creating a product around it. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite people in the world who's a pioneer in this industry, Bill Harvey, with his RMT technologies, he's documented for years this concept of what he calls driver tags. And driver tags technology looks at your ad, either a TV ad or a digital ad, and the emotional state that it's trying to get people into mm -hmm. and matches it to certain programs. And they've been able to demonstrate that if you have a TV spot and you go in and you look at where it's at, what programs it's airing on, not the day part and stuff like that, but what actual TV programs, and you make some changes, you can increase sales substantially. And it's, it's been researched and done. And I think there's also, it's based on the concept that soda companies know that dramas don't sell more soda, comedies do. And it's something about the emotional state of what the product is. So it, it's important to remember that when you're putting together branding and you're thinking of upper funnel, it's it your job is not to sell. Your job is to kind of hook something emotional inside of that person to remember them. I was always told that BMW ads were not to get people in their 40s and 50s to buy a BMW, they were designed for 15 year olds to aspire to want to be able to drive a BMW when they're in their 30s and 40s. And I'm like, well, that's some really forward thinking. That's, that's pretty cool. And I think a lot of marketers today that have had their eyes in the data thinking that the magic is there. It's like, no, no, no. The magic is kind of in panning back and looking at the whole big picture and understanding that you're not just selling to computers, you're selling to humans who are very involved, who work across not just conscious, but unconscious levels and respond to colors and emotions. Like I, one of the things that was very frustrating for me in the early days of C3 metrics, and remember in the early days, we had these ad servers and ad servers were designed around the idea that you could send out ad tags to all of your digital partners and you could go in and you could change your ad make a change to it, and it would immediately distribute across all of your different partners. It was absolutely incredible. But I saw very few marketers that would do that. and Because what they would do is they would run a different ad, they would find it wouldn't perform as well, and then they would go back. You know, they would always say the blue background one worked really well. And I would always say, you know, there's a millions of variations of blue. In fact, you could create a, a different color blue that the human eye can't see, but the brain can perceive just a little tiny difference. And just by playing with those, you can do a major, major shift. 
and the ability of people clicking and eventually buying and mm. feeling better about the brand. But again, that takes a little bit of work. That takes a little bit of being able to step back and understand how humans get hooked into things and make decisions about buying and, and, and getting involved with brands and engaging with brands. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, interesting. And I like your example of BMW, although uh, the problem with BMW is that the CFO may not want to fund you for 10 or 15 years while they're waiting for that sale to come. And uh, so you do kind of need, you know, that balance of, uh, you know, what can I sell today? What can I sell tomorrow? And what can I sell hopefully in, in 10 years? And, uh, and I, th I think that's, uh, you know, that's really where it's going, but uh, maybe with that as a backdrop. Uh, so how does, how does that, uh, and, and this new uh, cookie apocalypse, how does all that come together to really shape what's going on with marketers uh, digital campaigns? Well, for, for marketers today, it, it's going to change how they go about targeting most importantly, uh, any marketer today who's been involved with Facebook, even for the last three or four years, the, they've noticed that when they logged in, all of their targets that they used to have, where you could dig down, you know, you could target men, a certain age group that likes certain things. And there used to be all these really cool things in there. You could target Ford F-150 owners who leased, whose lease was about to expire. You could go that detail. Well, guess what? That's all gone now. It's all gone. And so marketers who are used to that, it, it, there is a realization that, wow, their jobs are getting a lot harder. They have, to, they're, they're, they have to market to larger groups at a time. And they're also starting to realize that when they started talking about the advantages of digital marketing, they would look at TV as like, oh, what a waste. You know, blanket entire city, blanket the entire US. I can actually target. But what they didn't realize is that as you target, the closer your targets get in, well, that just increases your rate to hit people, whereas that broader view actually is less expensive per person. And it yep. just makes your job a little bit more. So, that, so the first thing is, is that the targeting becomes more difficult. And what, what that means is, is that you really have to focus on your creative. You really have to optimize your creative. You have to optimize the story and start thinking more and more about the funnel and start thinking more and more about your person. And the people you're targeting, it used to be back in the, it wasn't that long ago where marketers would say, our, you know, our, our customer's name is Jane. She is 24 years old. She lives in New York City. She has a dog and a fiance. And, and they would have a whole persona. They would have five or six different personas. <laughs> I, I haven't seen, you know, directed consumer marketers, they don't do that persona building as much because you really want to start to get into their head you want to do some legwork and maybe do some focus groups where you start testing creative. One of the nice things about digital marketing is that you can test creative very easily and very quickly. It's really, really incredible. And, but also for marketers today, because as we've talked, Guy, about how upper funnel is so important, it's now so easy to kind of stick your foot out there and start testing some upper funnel stuff. Now, the greatest place to be able to do that, I, I think, is YouTube. And the nice thing about YouTube is you've got pre-roll uh, where people are about to watch a video and they have to watch another video. They can't skip it. And that used to be, it used to be in the US, the most expensive, the most valuable media that you could buy was the pre-roll before the movies. Now, some of folks listening, they don't go to movies anymore, but it used to be we would never go early because we knew the commercials would be going and it was usually like a slideshow. But if the movie started at four, you show up at four o'clock and there's like 10 minutes of pre-roll. And that's usually when everyone is in the seat. And let me tell you, you could do such a great job of targeting because you could target based upon the movie, you could target based upon geo. And it was so powerful and so expensive. But guess what? You can do that same thing at an even greater scale mm -hmm. And you can target based upon the types of videos that you think your personas of watch are watching on YouTube. And then you can also test your creative. And the nice thing is you don't have to get a TV ad made. You're talking like a 15 second video. Now that's very difficult is to edit your brand message, how you're going to get this across in 15 seconds. And that requires a little bit of legwork. So that's the first thing is to start to think about where can I go to build awareness. Now, the why you want to do that is because if you've got a hot product, that's awesome. 
But there's going to be a point where we're going to hit everyone in that addressable market. And now you have to start getting people earlier who aren't in market yet. Maybe they're not even aware. You have to build that awareness up. And that's what the upper funnel is all about. Then you have to start to think about, okay, well, how am I going to measure all this stuff? Because like we're in a podcast right now. People today learn a lot about products and services from podcasts, but there's nothing to click on a podcast when you advertise on it. So, and podcasts, they come out on a certain day, but people download them and don't necessarily listen to them that day. And they have a lifespan all of their own. So how do you measure that? There's no tab in Google Analytics for podcasts. It's very, very difficult. So you have to start to think about your measurement a little bit differently. And kind of the unifying metric that we see at Provolytics across all media is the same thing that's always been there, which is impressions. You know, how many, how many impressions are out there in the marketplace? Now, somehow with digital, it shifted. In the beginning, it was about impressions, but it, there was no impressions in Google Analytics, so the click became relevant. And I even know today, and a lot of organizations at the C-level, they still convert everything to a click-through rate, the CTR. Oh, the CTR on this is very high. Well, of course it is. It's, it's not designed to get clicks. It's designed to build awareness. And most marketers today, they don't know about this concept of ad stock. I recommend everyone go and, and Google ad stock. There's a great Wikipedia article that talks about the concept that somebody sees an ad, it builds awareness, and they don't do anything, but it, it leaves a little message in the back of the brain. And there's all these um, measurement techniques and mathematical techniques that you can evaluate ad stock and see kind of this lagged long-term impact that media has. What's really cool about it is that some media you buy, it doesn't have an immediate effect, but that long-term impact is much greater than any immediate effect of any other media you'll ever buy. And that's typically upper funnel. So marketers need to start re-educating themselves. They need to start realizing that all of the answers are not in Google Analytics. They may want to start taking some lessons online about how to do some simple regression analysis and start looking at how many impressions are in market each day across each one of the places where they're buying their media and maybe start looking at different ways of looking at things uh, versus clicks because clicks are not going to show it greater than 50, 60% of the media they're buying. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it is definitely a mind shift. And, and what, what's fascinating about, you know, what you talk about, and I think we deal with this every day, is that if you go back like to the, uh, the pre-digital stone age and in marketing, then it was all about, you know, demographics, uh, you know, adults or women, you know, between the ages of 35 and 55. And I'm going to buy the TV programs that give me the best coverage of those demographics. <laughs> And, and now all of a sudden the digital marketers that were used to being able to target, like you said, the persona, the person that's interested in this and he's, he's interested in, in the, he likes the color blue and he does this and he does that and get to those 10 people and really give them a very valuable ad. All of a sudden these digital marketers are, are having to go back to the stone age and figure out how to buy on a, and how to market on a, on a much larger audience. It's, it's kind of fascinating to watch and not that I'm happy about it. I, I, I personally, as a media consumer, I'd rather get an ad that I'm interested in as opposed to, you know, getting something that I'm, I'm not about to buy a, a, a new house. I'm not about to buy a new Ferrari. I'm not about to, so I don't need to see that stuff, but I am about to buy something and whatever that is, I'd rather have that targeted uh, ad. Um, and, and the think, other thing, yeah, go ahead. No, I, I think we all would guy, you know, and, and that's really what this is all about. But I tell you that the, this, you know, every direct to consumer brand that I know out there does like direct mail retargeting. Someone shows up at the website, maybe they engage yeah. a little bit, but they don't buy. And then three or four days later at your household, you'll get a, you'll get a postcard offering you a coupon and they all swear by it. Oh my God, this stuff works great. And I'm always like, okay, well, you know who you targeted to get there, you know what age group, you know the cities where you have customers at, how about trying a direct mail drop? Oh, no, 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 we're, we're not gonna do that. I'm like, well, your efficiency would go up dramatically. Or marketers that are doing CTV and they're like, oh my God, this, this works incredible. Okay, well, why don't you test just an ad buy in one geo you know, on local. Oh, you know, and, and part of the reason is because 
CTV is so easy. You know, it's, it's, it's become mm. digitally enabled and buying TV, you know, usually to buy TV, you got to go to someone our age in order to enable it. It's, it's got all of these steps involved. <laughs> it's very complicated. And so I'd rather go that route. But, but the reality is a lot of that traditional uh, media has, has so many efficiencies built into it. And, and that's where you start to see marketers really start to scale. And it's been exciting to see some of these direct-to-consumer brands have started to move on. And they're like, you know, they're now like bigger brands and they're buying national TV. They're doing direct mail. Hell, some mm-hmm. of them are even doing print. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. But smaller brands should start to think about how to step outside of the box that they're in to really improve their efficiencies overall. Well, and to your point, you now, as a smaller brand, you can buy CTV pretty inexpensively to cover what you're trying to do. And then as well, the integration with uh, targeted or programmatic direct mail is, uh, is definitely there. And I remember sitting with a friend of mine, he was the VP of analytics somewhere uh, with, I think it was one of the beer companies and at the time. And uh, he says, why even give them a coupon? Why do we always want to give them a coupon all you need to do is give them a strong, you know, a reasonably strong call to action. You don't have to give them money for it. They've already been convinced that they're interested. They've shown you interest. Now get them to, you know, over the finish line by, uh, by you know, either direct mail or email, whatever it happens to be. But at least, you know, uh, try and save some of that money off the coupons when, you know, you don't need to give them a coupon. Well, you're absolutely right about that. I think e-commerce has done a, a ridiculous job. The expectation now is for every consumer online is that everything is either on sale, and if it's not on sale now, it will be on sale later. Yep. Uh, and you know, it used to be that when you would do MMM studies, you would bring in all the pricing and all the promotion. And when you start to look at data now from direct to consumer brands, there's always promotion going on. It's they're never not in market with the promotion. It's it at least every month. And then they always extend the time and yep. then, and then they'll give it like two or three days. And then another promotion starts because everything online is so promotionally driven. It's just the way business is done these days. And as a consumer, I kind of like it. I don't mind it. <laughs> you know? Well, and I'm there. No question about it. There's a couple of things that I buy and I always wait for the buy three, get one free or the buy two, get one free. Because you can buy, you know, as much as you need. You know, there's going to be another deal coming up, and uh, right. so you know, and and so I'm a, you know, I buy on deal. Uh, but nevertheless, I did want to mention one other thing, you know, about going to the movies and watching the uh, and watching the commercials. My wife and I argue. I want to get there early so I can see the commercials. <laughs> she wants to get there late so that she can avoid the commercials. And so <laughs> we kind of have to negotiate as to when we actually get to the movies. So, um, all right. So now let's uh, I know digital is, is huge. And we've been talking about that for the last uh, you know while here. Uh, what other problems do you see facing uh, marketers today? I think the biggest problem for marketers overall is how to navigate the finance aspect of things. How do you how do you demonstrate that what you're doing is actually working, and how do you how do you actually prove it? I think that historically marketers have been afraid of the CFO because usually when you meet with them. It, it usually your budget gets cut and that's that's always a problem and and typically what happens is especially if you're working at a publicly traded company or or one that is rather large you do get calls in always at the end of the quarter it's like uh you know it's two weeks for the end of the quarter and finance tells you you need to cut marketing by 90 percent because we have to hit our numbers and oh by the way there's always a, a caveat that goes with it like an example of one is cut spend by 90% like today for the last two weeks of the quarter, but it cannot impact sales this quarter. That's, yeah. that's yeah. one caveat. Or the other one is cut spend 90% next two weeks, but it cannot impact sales next quarter. So it's like, what do most yeah. marketers do? Well, they just, they have no idea. And, and, and if, you're, if you have good measurement in place, and you have the scenario where you can't impact sales this quarter. Well, what you know is, you know, don't cut lower funnel tactics. You know, don't cut the stuff that has already got the people that are ready to buy to push them over the edge. 
And if it's next quarter that can't be impacted, cut the lower funnel stuff, but don't cut the upper funnel stuff mm. because it'll come around and, and bite you in the behind there. So I think that's one of the biggest issues. The other issue is that in most organizations, uh, especially for CMOs, there's things that are legacy tactics that they inherit, that they're yeah. afraid to touch, uh, even though they may know inside mm. that it doesn't have the right kind of impact, or maybe there's something that they think. There's always things in every organization that they know works. And what ends up happening when, when my team comes in is the measurement folks, we're, we're independent, we hook up all the, all the data, it starts coming in and we come in and we show that, that that sacred cow, if you will, is not working at the level that they think. And the, the machine, the math says, you can cut it 90% and sales are going to be fine. And of course, there's no way that anyone is willing to cut it. Yeah. But then, yeah. We, then we come to an agreement. We say, do you think that sales would be impacted if you cut it 5%? And they're like, yes, I do. And we're like, well, how long do you think it'll take? Well, we think if we cut it 5%, we'll see something within a week. So we get an agreement. Let's do a test. We don't have to tell finance. We're just going to cut it. That's the only change we're going to make. And we'll check back every day to see how things are doing. <laughs> and it always happens. The end of a week, nothing shifted. Sales are fine. Two weeks, nothing has shifted. Now we're at the end of a month. We've cut this sacred cow 5%. Sales are completely fine. So now this becomes very interesting because now this becomes a story that you can tell. Let's cut it a little bit more. We cut a little bit more. We don't reallocate the money. We just cut and things are completely fine. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden we find something that nobody has ever wanted to touch. It's been a small player, but the modeling, the math is telling us, hey, there, there's some volume here. We can, we can put some more money here to work and it will really return. So we take money away from that. We put it over here and all of a sudden sales start to go up. Now, this is a story we can go and tell finance. Say, hey, we wanna show you what we did. We ran an experiment. People love experiments because there's learnings from it. The one thing that finance and the C-level loves to hear is they love to hear, we did this. This is what we learned. These are things we're going to do moving forward. These are things we're not going to do moving forward. And those are great lessons. And that's where you go when you get budget. Because then when you go to the CFO and say, we took 10% from here, we put it here. And this is why we saw sales rise 10, 15%. Immediately, the CFO is going to say, how much more do you think that thing can handle? Now, what you don't want to say is, oh, we could go crazy with it. <laughs> You don't want to do that because then expectations are going to go through the roof. What you want to do is want to say to the CFO, we think we can handle 10% more. Let, you know, if you could give us a little, a little bit more money. Yeah, yeah, we'll give you 10% more. And, and you know, then you go back next month and you say, I, we think there's more, more room here. That's where you start to get budget. You don't try to go and get it from the whole thing. You start with small little tactics and you grow. And that builds up trust between you and finance. And that's how you grow a budget over time. So yeah, it you takes know, it, work. It takes that back and yeah, forth. Yeah. Well, and it's the political play. And unfortunately, you know, one of the things that I think uh, is, well, two things is, you know, you write the CFO is favorite three letters or C-U-T. And um, uh, awesome. but the problem, though, is, too, when they do, you know, they say cut, you know, in the last two weeks, cut your money. We got, you know, blah, blah, blah. They don't cut your bonus expectations. Because technically, my bonus is based on what I negotiated with you to spend for the full year. And if you cut that, they never changed my bonus expectations. And so then all of a sudden, you know, the CMO, has, he's got no chance of making his bonus anymore. And, uh, you know, so there's, there's like two or three rounds of, of different dimensions that have to come into place, including then the bonuses and the bonuses of the whole marketing team. No, you're so. actually right. And, and, and as I always say to folks that, when you're dealing within your organization, it's important to understand what the needs of the organization are, but also you have to hone in on the needs of the individuals you're dealing with. Uh, it's incredibly important to focus in on that, especially to build consensus. And this is what we're talking about, to build a rapport with your CFO and the finance team. It's all about doing little tiny tasks and demonstrating that you know what you're talking about and demonstrating the proof because all you got to do is show them that you, you make a little tiny change and sales go up. And my God, you, you've, got, you've got their respect. You've proven to them that you, you know what you're doing. And that's absolutely incredible. I have a client right now that came in and, and 
through some analysis on his own, he knew that about 80% of what they were spending had zero impact. And he went in, he had just come in to a new marketing role and he literally gave the CFO uh, well over a million dollars a month back. And the CFO was like, uh, should I change expectations? He's like, no, no, it wasn't doing anything. He's like, really? And he says, yeah, I'm going to ask for the money back in a couple of months once I get a handle on things. But this was money that was being completely wasted. And the CFO was nervous. But when the next month, the numbers were exactly the same. The rapport that he had now has yeah. with finance is yeah. absolutely incredible. Yeah. And it's that trust. But you have to you have to work on it within the org. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we are just about out of time, but there is always one question I like to ask. And uh, because marketing is not just about senior marketers, it's also about, you know, the new and the upcoming and the entry level marketers. So what kind of advice would you give for uh, an up and coming marketer? Well, I'll give two pieces of advice. The first piece of advice, read that book, Lemon by Orlando Wood, How the Advertising Brain Turned Sour. I'll guarantee you that no one in your organization has read it and it, <laughs> you will be a genius in, in all your discussions. That, that's the first piece of advice. The second piece of advice is always challenge yourself every single week uh, in terms of your skill set, developing your skill set, both digitally and in traditional media, uh, because marketing is a constantly changing and evolving science and art. And if you just focus in on the job day to day that you're doing, you're going to get behind very, very quickly. I, every week I go out and I learn new things. And we were talking earlier, guy, about chat GPT and all the cool things that it can do. Uh, just dig into that. Just play with it. You're going to find that it's going to expand your thinking and that will help you in your day to day job. And you'll start to improve your skills and increase your skill set that will make you more valuable to any organization. That, that would be my recommendation. Yeah, fantastic. I, and I agree with that. I think uh, those are definitely things that uh, are critical. And, and I have not read that book, but I am, uh, I'm about to go off and buy it. So I'm looking forward to that. Thank you for that recommendation. My so, pleasure. Uh, and I'll give, you, I'll give you one other thing. He has another one out too, called Look Out. <laughs> it's a little thicker. This one is my favorite, but this one has a very cool picture on the back with the okay. dog and the phone. But they're both absolutely amazing. And I'm telling you, this is best books in marketing that, that, that I've ever read. And, and, and again, for any marketer who reads them, they, they will be able to point out facts and figures and graphs that will help any presentation with any client or any internal discussion. It'll be, they'll be ahead of their class instantly just by reading these. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you for that. And uh, definitely look forward to reading them. Jeff, thank you so much. I'm so glad we were able to set this up. And thank you for participating. Um, where would you like uh, our viewers to go to learn more about you and your company? Uh, the best place to go is to go to provalytics.com. And if you're interested in learning more about kind of this emerging space, for about the last dozen years or so, I've created a scorecard or a playbook, if you will, of all the players in this space. This is an emerging, constantly changing field. And that's available there for free. You can download it, our attribution playbook. It talks about all the criteria that you need to think about because you know, our product may be good for you, but it may not be need, it may not be exactly what you need. There may be other players as well, too. So it's a great space for you to learn a lot more. Provalytics.com. Fantastic. And that's uh, provalytics.com, P-R-O-V-A-L. Y-T-I-C-S dot com, Provalytics. Uh, thank you again, Jeff. And otherwise, to the viewers, uh, please stay tuned for other videos in this series of the backstory on marketing. And please visit marketingmachine.prorelevant.com to download the first chapter of my book and other valuable excerpts. And of course, don't forget to sign up for more episodes. And if you liked this episode, please rate it with five stars. Thank you very much. 